Hello, everyone. I am Karen Keene, the National President of the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome you today to another in our series of Embracing Our History, a set of webinars that are brought to you by a grant from the Government of Ireland in the we, um, Immigrant Support Program. And now I'd like to introduce to you our president for the state of Maryland, Kathleen Norris, who will introduce you to our panel and facilitate this webinar. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, thank you so much, Madam Pre uh, National President. Good morning. I would like to welcome Luke McCusker, Managing Director of the Irish Railroad Workers Museum, as he presents Baltimore Irish and the Building of America's First Railroad. The Irish of Baltimore were among the city's earliest leaders and played vital roles in the development into major shipping center, both by land and sea. In the years that followed, thousands of Irish laborers immigrated there for abundance of work to establish homes, educate their children, and work freely within the supported ethnic neighborhoods that flourished in the years following the great hunger. Luke is here to tell their story. Luke. I turn the presentation over to you. Well, thanks. I appreciate your warm welcome. And uh, it's so good that each one of you can be here with us today. Uh, the Irish Railroad Workers Museum was begun uh, in 2002 when the, when the grand opening was held. We're coming up to our 20th anniversary. And our place is in the shadows of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum in West Baltimore. Just to give you a little uh, perspective, we are about 10 or 12 blocks west of the inner harbor of Harbor Place uh, and, and right along the right near the same street that Harbor Place is, is Pratt Street. Uh, of course, that's where the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad began uh, back in 1828. So we welcome anybody that's coming through Maryland. Uh, to, to pay us a visit. We just had a couple visitors from Philadelphia yesterday. Uh, they told me you can get a great price on a train ticket if you're a senior and you book 21 days in advance. That's what they did. And we welcomed them to the museum from Philadelphia just yesterday. Um, I'm going to share a, a PowerPoint presentation to you today and talk about different themes and uh, emphases of our museum and the story we're featuring today. A neat thing about our museum is that people walk in the front door with their treasures. And sometimes they say things like, our kids don't want it, can you use it? Maybe you've had that experience in your family. Uh, Don Torres came in here one day with a, a group shot that included his grandfather who worked in the foundry of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Um, and so he shared that with us that you can see the X above the head of Mr. Kelly there. Uh, uh, Francis Xavier Kelly, as a matter of fact, uh, him and his crew working the railroad. And I want to give you some uh, perspective, if I could, about what kind of what kind of town Baltimore was and is. Uh, 1752, so this is pre-Revolutionary uh, War. Only 25 homes in Baltimore, only one church. Uh, just so everybody knows, and during those days, even though we're in Maryland and people people perceive Maryland as a place of religious freedom, there was not religious freedom from about 16, in the 1690s up until the Revolutionary War and the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the only church, uh, only public church that was available to anyone was an Anglican or Episcopal church. Uh, Catholics met in private homes, uh, not only in Baltimore, but throughout the state of Maryland. Uh, but that's what, that's what was going on back in 1752. But Baltimore was a place that had deep harbors and, and was, was a prime spot to welcome the large sailing ships of the earlier generation. Um, and it was a couple neighborhoods that are nearby in Baltimore were actually towns in and of themselves. One called Jonestown and the next one called Fells Point, which we'll talk about a little bit today. Baltimore had a lot of early Irish leaders, and one we focus in a lot around here in, in Baltimore and in Maryland in general is Charles Carroll of Carrollton. 
He was the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. Of course, he had an Irish heritage, might have been America's richest man. We're not quite sure, but he sure had a lot. Uh, and of course, in those days, rich men held, uh, held their wealth in two areas, uh, in land holdings and in slaves. And he was typical of a rich man of his time, uh, having over 300 slaves uh, under, under, his, uh, under his control. Um, another important name that so many of you probably know at least half of his name, uh, James McHenry. Uh, he, was from, he was from the north of Ireland. Uh, we think about him as being from County, County Antrim. Uh, he was actually the personal physician for General George Washington. After the war was over, he became Secretary of War and also established a home in West Baltimore named Fayetteville. Uh, Marquis de Lafayette was Mr. Popularity after the war. Everybody was naming stuff after him, and that was really true in Baltimore as well. Uh, he had a lot of property. Uh, he died in the, 18, the late 1810s, um, and his family had to figure out what were they going to do with his extensive land holdings, and that's part of our story today. A cousin of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the Charles Carroll the barrister, just like his cousin, he studied for law in Europe. A Catholic could not uh, practice law in America or in Maryland at that time, um, and but they both uh, sat uh, and studied law in Europe and became uh, qualified lawyers. However, when Charles Carroll came back, he decided he wanted to pack, practice his trade in Maryland he converted to the Protestant faith, but he also had a, has a very nice estate, uh, not far from our museum, probably five, six minutes away. Um, and he, still there, still a beautiful spot. Um, and, but he also held lots of land that eventually became part of the B&O Railroad. Another famous Irish leader early in Baltimore, George Brown. Of course, maybe, you, maybe you're familiar with his father's name more than, more than George's, Alexander Brown. Uh, financiers financiers uh, in their family. Um, and of course, what's the, num two, number, the two big things you need in order to uh, run a railroad? Well, you need finances uh, because you are, you know, you're doing something brand new and they were selling lots of stock and lots of people were investing in this brand new idea. Um, he became a board member uh, for the BO and a treasurer. And once again, he was another one of the ambitious uh, Ulster Irish that arrived in Baltimore in its early days. Now, Baltimore in and its, in its of itself was at the center of shipping. Uh, and of course, the early shipping, the, the, only, the only shipping that anybody had much conversation about was uh, going across the superhighway of the time, according, coming across the Atlantic Ocean and into the large uh, port cities of the East Coast. We, we think of Boston, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, and then around the horn, you know, New Orleans certainly got its share of shipping. Uh, so they all, came, they all came into America. Baltimore was a prime spot, deep harbors, and it also had um, it, 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 had, it was about 200 miles closer to the center of America than the other towns because of the Chesapeake Bay that Baltimore uh, sits upon. So Baltimore was a huge place for the shipping industry in those early days. For that reason, many, many early Irish came to Amer America and then to Baltimore, not for famine related reasons, but for economic reasons. The work was plentiful in Baltimore. Uh, they many moved into the area of Baltimore known as Fells Point. And, the, and uh, one of the earliest uh, Catholic churches in the city of Baltimore was open in 1792, St. Patrick. Uh, this is right on the main drag of that neighborhood over on the east side of Baltimore um, off of Broadway. And even today, that is where the, the St. Patrick's Day Mass is held in Baltimore. Uh, the parish is Irish one day a year these days. Uh, most of the year it's, uh, it's Hispanic, but uh, that's, a, that's a big day for the Irish and a big day for the church. And many have attended those masses there and, and been, been very supportive of them continuing. So we're glad for that. Frederick Douglass is one of the early uh, 
workers in the city of Baltimore. Uh, however, when he arrived, he arrived as, as, a, as a slave and also as a companion to a young boy that lived in Fells Point. Uh, it's, it's in Baltimore that uh, Frederick Douglass developed uh, his abilities in reading and writing. That was Ill illegal at the time, but he figured out ways. He actually worked with a lot of the little, the little Irish boys that were being educated, and he, he had a little bartering system. You teach me some, some more reading and writing skills, and maybe I'll slip you uh, some baked goods uh, that I get at home. And so the, the Irish boys and Frederick Douglass had a little system. And uh, that, that went very well. But in those days, uh, Baltimore is a place where a considerable amount of African-American uh, population lived and still lives, of course. 78% of African-Americans in Baltimore during those days, 1830, they were free. They were, they, were, they were not slaves and they were working for their own benefit and they made up a, a very large part of Baltimore's population about 23%. Of course, they outnumbered the Irish by a factor of 10 uh, in those days. And so when, when it came time for a railroad to come, uh, a lot of the Irish started thinking, it's kind of tough going in the shipping business uh, with, with, the, with the way the population is and, you know, friends hiring friends and recommending friends. It was it, the Irish were looking for a new place to make a living and a new place that they could do well. Uh, and of course, the shipping was in East Baltimore, but West Baltimore would soon have a big opportunity. But in those early days, we think about all the, the shipping that was going on uh, across the Atlantic, but people were moving inward. They were moving inland, they were moving west. Imagine that kind of, that kind of language, people, uh, when, when they said we're going west in those days, they were thinking Ohio. To them, that was west. Uh, but anyway, that's how things were back in those days. People were moving uh, a bit further west in, in New York State, in Ohio, uh, Kentucky, different places like that. But things could only get so far in a large uh, uh, seagoing ship. It was time for, for people. It was time for freight, time for finished goods to head to the middle of the country and how were these cities going to facilitate that? Um, and there was a lot of energy towards the building of canals. Of course, uh, up in New York, the Erie Canal was finished by 1825. The C&D Canal in Delaware uh, had been, been begun around the same time. Um, and uh, the Irish that were in America during those days they worked awfully hard in the canal business. This is pre-railroading, uh, 75 cents a day. Well, that was high times for the Irish back in the early 1820s. This is the kind of the idea of what, uh, what canal work was like. Not real high tech, was it? We've got, we've got barges being pulled by mules. You know, and uh, they make their way, you know, they head west as, as at the speed that a mule decides he can walk. Uh, so that's pretty slow. Um, however, people thought of this as the way to go because that's, that was the technology of the day. Um, and, and they did so through a lot of different uh, cities. And Baltimore is looking around and saying, well, what are we going to do? We're, not, we're losing our place as a primary and a vital shipping center because other cities are sending things further west. So if you're, if you're sending a, if, if a ships arriving across the Atlantic Ocean with goods that are supposed to be heading westward, well, Baltimore wasn't the answer anymore, was it? Because everything stopped at the shoreline in Baltimore and other cities were making the steps forward to change shipping, uh, taking, taking shipping uh, of goods further west via canal. It was dangerous work for the Irish when they worked on these canals. Uh, and different writings during that time uh, help us to understand, get a picture of what uh, canal work was like for the Irish. Uh, a, a British woman named Frances M. Trollope, uh, 19, 1832, she wrote a book talking about, she, she had just come to America to travel and to write commentary about what she saw. And of course she came to Baltimore, she came to a lot of other 
uh, large places in, in America. But one of the things she saw was the workers on the canal. And this, this was pretty typical of, of the Irish uh, predicament in those early days. Uh, what a horrible word, but we're, we're going to use it because it really, it really illustrates uh, the plight of the Irish in those early days. Many considered them to be disposable. If there was no investment to bring in Irishmen uh, into your business, uh, such as slaves. Slaves were, frankly, pretty darn expensive, weren't they? Uh, but an Irishman would come, no down payment, no investment, and you just paid them at the end of the workday. And that's just how things were. So, so an Irish was not a financial investment. He was just merely a commodity, I guess you would say in a certain way. They'd work for just a little bit of money and a little bit of whiskey to help them with the pain and to sleep at night. And if they happened to die, Francis uh, mentioned that she had seen uh, where an Irishman was sick and dying and no doctoring was available to him. And, and, and he, his body gave way to, to whatever the problem was. And they just would bury him in an unmarked grave and then move uh, to hiring another Irishman who would do similar work with, with similar plight. Here's an idea of what, what life was, a picture of what life was like in those days. Of course, they would dig the large ditches where the water would go. They would also dig, dig and assemble the locks. Um, it was a low paying work, but it was work. And uh, many Irish came to America uh, for the economic opportunity, uh, as, as modest as it was. Other work the Irish did in those early days include coal mining, uh, or um, I have an ancestor, my, one of my earliest ancestors, uh, came from Ireland and he worked in a chromium mine and that was in the Lancaster area of Pennsylvania. Even boys got into, into work uh, in this difficult work. Here's a picture of what people call breaker boys. They were, they were young fellows that weren't quite ready to go down in mines but they could work in a, in a sorting system like you can see here, uh, picking out the things that weren't coal, maybe busting up a uh, uh, pieces of coal that were a little bit bigger uh, and couldn't get through the mechanical systems of the day quite so well. But even at, at the, imagine how old are these boys? Are they, are they 10 or 12 years old maybe? But they're already at work doing difficult, dirty, dangerous work in those early days. Well, Baltimore wanted to be part of this, but they wanted to do something different. They didn't want to be another town that has a canal heading westward. Some of the early leaders of the, of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had gone to England and seen a contraption, uh, a steam powered contraption going up and down hills and carrying coal, uh, a very modest uh, st steam engine uh, that was being used by uh, the coal industry uh, in, you know, certainly not in the state of uh, pulling a railroad, uh, but it, it, it was a steam powered mechanical item and that, that they, they, the little light went on in their head and they, they said, you know what? Baltimore can be a place where we're, we're not going to build a canal heading westward. We're gonna do something that's never been done before. We're gonna build a railroad and we're gonna go from Baltimore to the Ohio River. You know, you, they might as well have said, we're going to go to the moon. You know, uh, imagine those days of making such a statement. Well, everybody bought in. Everybody thought this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And we're going, Baltimore is going to maintain its leadership in the shipping industry, not by another town with another canal, but by a railroad heading westward. Uh, so the big day, July 4th, 1828, this fellow that you might've you might have heard about in school way back when, uh, John Quincy Adams, President of the United States was down in Georgetown outside of Washington, D.C., and he was dedicating the C&O Canal going from that, that uh, suburb of D.C., Georgetown, all the way to Cumberland, Maryland, Maryland's second city or Queen City, as it's referred to. Um, and th that was an, uh, a 184 mile long uh, decision to get from Georgetown to Cumberland. 
But Charles Carroll of Carrollton, we've already talked about him a pretty good amount. Uh, he laid a cornerstone uh, for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad that same day. And they were going to figure out how, how they were going to create a railroad. Uh, they knew about the laying track, uh, but at that point, a locomotive had not been invented. Of course, that was, that was no concern of anybody in Baltimore. Hey, uh, somebody's going to invent one and we're going to do great. So everybody's real excited here in Baltimore. A uh, major parade was held. Everybody wanted to invest in this new idea of a railroad. Um, and it was actually, they, they sold stock and it was oversubscribed. So they sold, so to speak, they sold more stock than they had. Everybody wanted a piece of the piece of the action. And a large parade was held. Everybody that was anybody in Baltimore came along Pratt Street and, and marched and celebrated. Uh, Baltimore was going to do something no one else had ever done. Um, and there was even a song in the newspaper that day about we're all crazy in Baltimore. We're, here we are uh, asserting we're going to build a railroad. We don't even have a locomotive to pull, pull cars westward, but we don't care, we're doing it anyway. So they did big celebration, everybody's excited. Um, and and, the, and the, they started laying track heading westward. Um, first railroad station in America, this is the, this is the second building. Uh, the first one was lost to time, but a second building was built. And this, this um, is right outside the front gates, or right, right inside the front gates of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum. Open these days and a fabulous place to visit on your next trip to Baltimore, right before you come up the hill and visit the Irish Railroad Workers Museum. Uh, we talked about some of these families earlier, the, the Irish families, the Carroll family, the McHenry family had given land. Uh, they had their own financial reasons to want to invest in railroads, of course, you know, there's always an angle. But that being said, uh, land was given, tracks started to be laid, and, and the, freight, the freight and passenger office that you're seeing there was a hop, hopping happening place. Now, of course, in the early days, who pulled those, uh, those uh, freight cars and those passenger cars? Well, it was a horse. After all, there wasn't a locomotive even invented. But you can see to the right of this slide, there's something been done. Uh, in 1829, 1830, different, uh, different uh, uh, engineers, mechanical wizards, they, they did what they had to do to be able to create a steam locomotive that was powerful enough to, to pull a certain amount of weight uh, up a certain grade uh, for, for an extended period of time. And all of a sudden, the Baltimore and Ohio had a locomotive to head westward. They weren't going to be slow poking it through a canal with mules anymore. They were going, they were going high tech and high speed heading west with a pull of a locomotive uh, at the front of each train. Well, people got excited. <laughs> everybody wanted a piece of this everybody wanted a railroad to come to their town and the first the first energy of the B&O was to head westward to a place uh, you may be familiar with called Ellicott City uh, that was a 12 mile trip um, and that was the first real destination of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and so much of the work was done by uh, Irishmen uh, led by a contractor who was Irish himself John McCartney um, they even built, they even decided they were going to bring a railroad uh, into Washington, D.C. And that was done by 1835. So we're thinking about this, the, the foundation of the cornerstone being laid of a railroad on July 4th, 1828. Um, by by uh, 1835, so we've got seven years later, they've got rail service into Washington, D.C. Uh, imagine that. Um, and look at that fantastic uh, Thomas Viaduct there. Think about those rocks all piled up by men just with a brute, brute, uh, brute strength, uh, pulleys, uh, different mechanical things, but of course nothing in the way of, of uh, large power equipment to do that work. They did all this with the, with the technology of 1835 um, and uh, uh, the bridge is still operational today, and trains that are 20, 30 times as heavy 
as they were in 1835, still cross that bridge today. Um, and so much of that work was done by the Irish. The, the railroad did arrive in Ellicott City by 1830. DC, we talked about in 1835, and then out to Cumberland, Maryland, 1842, and finally to the Ohio River in 1852. The, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad eventually was in 13 different states. Uh, an overwhelming number of, of their laboring forces was Irish. Um, and that was true for canals, but it's also very true for, um, for railroads. The Irish were the primary source of labor in those days. Another era came that we're gonna talk a little bit about today, and that is the time of Angorta Moor, the time of the, the great hunger, um, and the time for, for a million uh, Irish, to, they, they would pass away and another million and a half would emigrate to other lands. Baltimore was one of their destinations. They didn't come to make a million dollars. They came merely to survive. One of the men that survived that trip, he traveled uh, in 1847 in May on this ship that's pictured here, the Margaret Hug. Uh, his name was James Feely. He was the man of the house at our museum at 918 Lemon Street. Uh, so he, he traveled to Baltimore from, from Derry uh, on a ship and arrived and began new life here in Baltimore as many, many uh, others did. Uh, of course, the, the, this is the first uh, major European group to arrive in Baltimore other than the, the English uh, and the, the Protestant Irish that came earlier. Suddenly, Catholic Irish from the west of Ireland uh, are departing in haste, uh, in panic mode, just wanting to survive, wanting their families to survive. They arrived in Baltimore on ships uh, somewhere. Th this ship actually looks kind of good, doesn't it? Of course, we all know about the horrors of some of the other ships of the era. But James Feely did arrive and, and came and worked on the railroad. All the people in Baltimore, when they arrived, had to uh, first pass through a quarantine station uh, in Baltimore area that's known as the Lazaretto Point Quarantine Station. Um, and here is James Feely's ship record arriving there in, in May of 1847. No one could come into the city proper unless they had first gone through quarantine. They would be inspected by civic uh, medical authorities and uh, given a, a bill of health uh, that they were in good enough condition to be amongst the general population of the city of Baltimore. Of course, uh, of course, the religious community came there to support them, to care for them, both Protestant and Catholic. Uh, a, an important group actually built a temporary hospital there and did so much to care for them. They were called the Hibernian Society. Uh, that was a non-denominational group dedicated to helping Irish arrivals of any denomination um, into the city of Baltimore and caring for them. Uh, and that was how th the Irish first started arriving in the days of the Great Famine. Many moved into West Baltimore. The work was waiting for them uh, at the B&O Railroad. Uh, they lived in alley houses, such as the ones that our museum is in. You can see uh, our two of our buildings pictured here with the flags flying. Um, and this was an ideal place for the Irish to begin again. Of course, it was right near work. We're only a block from the B&O. Uh, uh, school and church was just two blocks north at St. Peter the Apostle Church, Catholic Church, uh, complete with a uh, uh, pastor who was there for 56 years from County Donegal. His name was Edward McColgan. Uh, but anyway, they, they, of course, no famine people arrived uh, with money in their pockets to buy a house, but they could rent from Irish who had come in earlier days and become established. Uh, it took about a week's worth of pay for dad uh, in order to pay the, the month's rent. So not too outrageous. And of course, Baltimore is a unique town. When we think about when they, when they arrived, where did they go into? We all know the stories about New York. We think about the tenement housing when you have strangers above and below. In Baltimore, you rented a row house and that row house was all yours. 
uh, you could you could stick the brother-in-law up in the attic or in the basement if that's if that's what did you well, um, and he could help pay your rent. Uh, but when you brought over relatives, they could come and stay with you. Um, and these are rather small, uh, ten feet nine inches wide, twenty-three inches deep. I'm sorry, twenty-three feet deep. But you think about uh, the kind of homes the struggling, uh, modest Irish were coming from in the west of Ireland. Uh, I'm thinking they thought this was a palace, but that's just my opinion. We want to introduce you to the family uh, that lived next door that was part of, that was an Irish railroading family. This is James Feely that we talked about. He was the father of the house in the building that houses the Irish Railroad Workers Museum. Our only photograph of the family, is this thing great or what? Here he is, James and Sarah Feely uh, with three of their children. They're out on a Chesapeake Bay excursion. Uh, and I'm, I'm just shocked that the, our only picture of this, this, this poor family that barely survived it all and came to America, um, <laughs> here they are at the beach. Okay, so that's, I think that's pretty humorous. But anyway, it's a great picture. They're all sitting there in their rented bathing suits. They went on a Chesapeake Bay excursion and uh, got away from the cold dust of West Baltimore to have a, a fun day out. Uh, we think this is about 1871 based on the ages of the children. 1880, this is their census record. Of course, dad working in the boiler shops of the B&O. Uh, one of his sons was also down there with him. At some point, each of his sons worked there um, at the B&O. Um, and, and Sarah gave birth to 10, including little Cornelius that you can see as the bottom name on this record, born in 1875. But the Irish, when they arrived, of course, they were usually unskilled. Uh, you know, they, ha they had their abilities of doing certain things in the west of Ireland, but they didn't have much in the way of experience with heavy industry. Uh, when they arrived, they, of course, they started at the bottom. Being, being laborers. Um, and the fellow at the, on the left, we're gonna kind of say that he's our, he's our uh, uh, representative of the unskilled laborer just working on the tracks. He's got, he's got his uh, uh, mechanical things in hand to do whatever kind of work had to be done, but he would develop skills as the guys on the right did. I mean, later on they were working in, in uh, foundries, machine shops, uh, all different. Uh, we, one of the guy, Irish men on our block, he was a coach painter. Um, so people developed skills along the way. Some men developed leadership skills and some men developed highly advanced uh, engineering skills just from doing the work and learning as they went. Um, all those, all those hardworking Irishmen, they needed a lot of support and care. We're so thankful that a museum up in the New Hampshire area forwarded us this magnificent photograph. Uh, we, see, we see the young lady in the center. Um, she is taking care of dugout homes for railroad workers. Uh, with, we, we all probably have an idea of the, the image of the shanty. Uh, another, another thing that they would do as, as the rail tracks were advancing across the country, is they just simply find a hill and create a dugout home. And here she is caring for her family, uh, posing in front of a dugout home along the tracks of the railroad. Of course, she had to do her cooking in there, uh, keeping house as, as you, we can all imagine how, uh, how difficult that must have been. But uh, the railroad would supply uh, food for families to be supportive of the railroad workers. And, and the women had this, uh, uh, situation, and they had, they of course rose to the occasion, supported their husbands, uh, cared for their children as the tracks headed westward. Also, to talk about Irish women at work in general in, in the city of Baltimore, and I'm, I imagine that's true of many other cities, mostly uh, single women mostly worked as domestics. Uh, they would work in the home of the well to do. Uh, their, their uniform would be provided, a place to stay, and an income. So as a single woman, an Irish woman, uh, could develop a bit of financial independence. She had an income. She wasn't being supervised uh, directly by her parents or a husband. 
and she could make some of her own decisions about how she was going to spend her money. So she brought she would bring that financial independence uh, into marriage, uh, you know, often, of course. But tip, the typical pattern of the Irish women of the time is once they were would become married, they didn't work outside the home. Uh, th that was not necessarily true of other ethnicities in the city of Baltimore, but the Irish women stayed home. I imagine there was a, usually a pretty good reason about nine months after the wedding night. Um, but kids came fast and quick and home was uh, home became also her place of employment or her place to run her own cottage industry. Early days of an Irish family living in a row house in Baltimore, borders were a good answer. They could live like like we said, up in the attic, down and down in the basement. Um, she could provide them with meals, laundry service and a place to stay. And mom could slip slip that bit of rent money boarding the boarding fees that she charged into her pocket to run her own little financial empire. Later on, when there was lots of kids and there wasn't really an opportunity to have borders, um, becoming a washerwoman was a good answer for the, the, you know, the simpler Irish women, uh, often arriving illiterate, often arriving unskilled, just as the men, but they, they could do that kind of work. They could work as washerwomen, uh, taking in laundry from the well-to-do, returning it back uh, clean, pressed, folded, um, and they could do that in a bit of a, uh, their own time. You know, while the kids are taking a nap or in, or in school, she could do her work uh, for pay uh, at times that worked for her. Um, and that was a good way for the modest Irish women of the time to make their pocket money and, and contribute financially to the family on top of all their other uh, contributions. James Feely, we, we, a few slides ago, we saw the family at the beach and little Joanna was sitting uh, in, down in the front with a stripe, striped uh, bathing suit you saw. Here she is on her second wedding day, uh, the picture on the left, uh, her first husband had passed away. She remarried a fellow by the name of Daniel Shanahan. Of course, all these are temporary people. You know, this part of Baltimore, lots of temporary uh, families. Um, and Joanna and, and Daniel were, were certainly both that. Um, he was a well-to-do guy. He was a veterinarian and horseshoer for the city mounted police. And their children did well, but they had good income and their children did well. In the middle, we see uh, little Rita. She's the, she's the granddaughter of Sarah Feely that we saw in that early picture. She attended a very well-regarded uh, private school in West Baltimore. And her, her half-brother, uh, Daniel Jr., he, he studied at Loyola High School and College, went to Georgetown Medical, and became a doctor, and later the head of the OBGYN department of a local uh, hospital here in West Baltimore called Bon Secours. So, so uh, this is, these two young people, their grandparents were Irish immigrants. Uh, and at least their mother, was illiterate. Uh, her, I don't know about the, the father, but he did become a citizen and had a career on the railroad. Um, and so that hard work paid off. Just two generations later, they're both, their grandchildren are doing quite well. This is an example of one of the uh, places that the, uh, the domestic, uh, the Irish domestics would work, large mansion that just a uh, actually right behind the local Catholic church here in West Baltimore. Um, the man of the house, Thomas Winans, he had uh, gone, to, gone to Russia and built the first railroad there. He must have liked it. He comes back to Baltimore and builds himself a Russian villa. Imagine that. Well, anyway, lots of Irish uh, came there. Not, some, some, worked, some lived in work and worked for uh, the, the wealthy family. Uh, other ones just came in for the day but uh, they would bring lots of Irish into their estate. And that was the typical pattern, uh, the well-to-do hiring Irish to do the, do the work that they would just assume not do themselves. And that was a, a, a typical pattern here in the homes of West Baltimore where the railroading family settled. 
speaking of, ch of the children we've been talking about, this, this is the third school of St. Peter the Apostles Church and School. This one, be, this one was a co-ed school. Uh, in the early days, the, the, the local Catholic parish had Sisters of Mercy teaching the girls on one side of the block, and the Christian Brothers de La Salle teaching the boys across the street. By the time of uh, 1917, this was their third school building and opened up and became co-ed. But anyway, uh, many of the children that arrived in the early days of the parish uh, were, were, were the first generation, at least for, for quite a while, uh, that would be literate. Their, mo their mom and dad might have arrived illiterate, but their children would not be. The schools were waiting for them when they arrived in the time of the famine. The schools were already open even before they got here and priests and uh, brothers and nuns uh, worked hard to transform, you know, a, a, an illiterate, generally speaking, in an illiterate population into literate and capable of more things than they otherwise would have. But the school did other things as well. They opened up a commercial school for girls, which was sort of like a business school. Uh, learning office skills. Uh, this was after graduating eighth grade. Then you would go to the commercial school. Uh, they also had an, an academy on the block. Wealthy wealthy families could send their daughters to an academy and have a more advanced curriculum. And of course, that was all under the tutelage of the Sisters of Mercy. Here's one of those nuns that uh, we're talking so nicely about. They did such good work. She was a niece of Sarah Feely that lived at our museum. Um, she, she attended that same school on the last, last slide, became a, became a nun, a nurse, and a professor uh, in her, her career, uh, taught at Mount St. Agnes Colleges, College, and also in DC, if anybody's familiar, uh, for a short time, the Sisters of Mercy taught at Gonzaga uh, High School, a very well-known high school, uh, but she also worked there. But anyway, she eventually returned to St. Peter's and taught there uh, towards the end of her career. But she was she was the uh, daughter of a famine survivor who did very well. Thank you very much. Uh, learned a lot, did a lot and accomplished much. What well, a neat story that we've come to come to hear of lately was how Irish families developed. And we've come to have a relationship with Sister Ann O'Donnell. She is a, professor, a retired professor at Catholic University down in DC. Uh, she talks a good bit and she's, she's helped us with presentations before talking about parish life and family life of the Irish in West Baltimore. And she, one of her primary focuses is on her, her uh, great, great grandfather, Thomas O'Donnell, native of County Galway, he lived in that fancy house uh, that we saw a few slides ago. Believe it or not, he worked as a florist at the end of his career um, and did, did very well there. Uh, but life was not always uh, was not always standing over a table and, decor and, and arranging flowers for the fella. Um, he had a difficult life, as did his wife in Ireland during the time of the famine. Uh, actually, uh, they, they first stopped in England uh, that was their first stop as they es escaped Ireland, but later came to Baltimore, and he and his wife, Catherine, had, had seven children. Uh, they, the, these children were educated well and, and had a, their own uh, good measure of accomplishments. Uh, one of their sons, John, was a, was a uh, jail warden in the penitentiary. Uh, sounds, a, sounds a little uh, rough going, but it was, a, it was actually a uh, well-regarded and important position and he did well. Uh, his other son became a famous city police detective. Um, and the thing was, in those early days, uh, Sister Ann O'Donnell talks about how her ancestors lived in 15 homes during a 30 year period, but eventually bought a house on Holland Street uh, that's pictured there, uh, a large, wide, deep, full three story house in a, in a neighborhood where uh, upper management of the BNO, business owners, uh, other important people lived, no more living in a, in a 10 foot wide, uh, 23 foot deep row house. They were doing well and lived almost right across the street from St. Peter the Apostle Church. Um, and um, 
uh, lived there for many years. One of the more remarkable things about the O'Donnell family story is the, the church windows of St. Peter the Apostle Church. Uh, that, that same uh, police detective, Thomas O'Donnell Jr., purchased uh, with, in 1899 the church, uh, placed new stained glass windows within, and one of the purchasers was Thomas O'Donnell. He dedicated this to his mother, Catherine O'Donnell, who had lived a life of struggle and a life of service, not only to her family, but also to this church. So this beautiful window was placed there in her memory. And the, when, the, when the sunlight would shine through this stained glass window, the rays would settle on the house uh, on Holland Street where the O'Donnells lived. Um, and pictures are nice, but to see this uh, stained glass window in person is uh, truly remarkable. Okay, here you go. I, I imagine a few of you in this group just might know this young lady. But anyway, um, lots of important Irish women lived in the neighborhood. And we're going to talk about uh, a lady who lived at 116 South Poppleton Street. Now, when you look to the left side of this image, you see that Irish flag flying. That's where our museum is, the Irish Railroad Workers Museum, uh, just, you know, several doors down from this place right here. Uh, it was the home of Thomas J. Cavanaugh, Mrs. Thomas J. Cavanaugh and family. In there, she took care of a husband who was a major AOH leader, her son, and then even brought in three boarders. She must have not had much to do. So let's bring in three boarders and wash all their dirty railroad clothes too. Uh, so she was a hardworking woman, uh, but she also became the financial secretary of the LAOH Division IV back in 1895. Uh, Maryland State uh, LAOH formed their organization in her living room, June 12th, 1900. It was in the newspaper, so it's got to be true. Uh, and here, here's one, one, of your, one of your leaders of the past, Stacy Guerin, uh, a good friend of the museum, and taking a little pose in front of the home of Mrs. Thomas J. Cavanaugh, where the, where the state of Maryland's uh, uh, divi division began back in 1900. Of course, the vital work of the women was, all, often, was almost always uh, their work in the home. We recently had uh, this photograph arrived from a retired nun out in Kentucky. Imagine that. She sees our website. She says, oh, this is cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them our story, and maybe they'll, say, maybe they'll save their story for posterity so future generations can know about what happened in the Irish homes of West Baltimore. That's her grandfather sitting there in the middle. It's his first communion. And everybody gathered and look at him. You know, him and his, you know, there was 11 children in their row house. Um, and, and, and the nun tells this great story about uh, in those days that mom would say, I don't have borders in my house. If you're going to be a member of this family and live in this house, then you're going to do with, what, with your salary what your father does. You're going to bring it in. Uh, your money. Is, you're going to give your money to me. It's going to go towards ha housekeeping. Uh, it's going to go towards uh, me buying it, buying clothing for you. It's going. You'll have an allowance like your father has. And we're and we're going to run. Run. I'm going to run the show. And of course, when the time came for one of her children to move out and set up housekeeping themselves, she had a nice uh, a nice uh, pot pile of money that she'd received for them over the years so that they could start their own home and their own family and she would be a, she would her savings would go to contribute towards that um, but anyway a great photograph uh, we just love it and uh, he, and the little grandson over there towards the right side of the screen later on he became a priest himself uh, also wanted to talk about how, how work developed amongst the Irish women in those days. We think about this image, uh, women gathered in front of Lion Brothers, a uh, major embroiderer uh, along the block. If you look just over the roof of this vehicle, there's St. Peter and the Apostle Church. You see those in, in imposing columns uh, just above the roof. Uh, they would graduate school there and then walk down the street and begin 
uh, work uh, if they weren't going on to further uh, education. Uh, we, we imagine that this is a World War II era image um, and boy, did they have a lot of embroidered badges to make during World War II. Uh, some, di some did not go to Lion Brothers. Instead, they went to the commercial school. And we can see the graduating class here from 1943, uh, working in all different trades, uh, learning the office skills they needed to have a career of their own. Their church, uh, a better image of the church itself, a railroaders church, an active Irish parish, lots of Irish clergy, uh, of course, the divisions of AOH and LAOH folk uh, centered there. Um, and with Baltimore being the first, first archdiocese in America, the churches had particular importance, uh, especially in the early days. Um, and they, they had many focuses, including culture, uh, the Irish culture, Irish, Irish and, and classical music, and also temperance of all things, imagine that. Well, anyway, we wanna invite anybody that can come in the future to visit us at the Irish Railroad Workers Museum. Uh, we're open every Friday and Saturday. Uh, we welcome groups seven days a week if, if, uh, if a group wants to come uh, and uh, if, we're happy to come in and greet them and have tours at any time. We have many special programs. Uh, we have walking tours of the neighborhood. We just had one of them last Saturday and uh, that was great. Um, and so we are, we're an active, vibrant place, um, and we welcome any, any of you who would like to come. Um, we're we're going to have, have our Q&A session now. Uh, anybody have any questions you'd like to bounce off me? I'd love, I'd love to receive them. So, Luke, we had a few questions come in. Um, so one of them, but I believe you already answered, was about giving a better description of the alley house. So I know you went through the size and the dimensions. Was there anything else unique to it, to what an alley house was or, or how that term came to be? Well, sure. An alley house meant that it wasn't on the main thoroughfares of the city. It was in the smaller, the smaller modest uh, streets, you know, and, and, you know, if the street was less than maybe 20 feet wide, uh, then it, it, would be, it would be thought of as an alley rather than a major thoroughfare. So the houses that were on those streets were typically small, they were mo modest, and they were, they were lived in by uh, the laboring classes rather than the fancy folks. Great, thank you. Let me get to the next question. Um, the other question, there was a comment made about the Hibernians being non-denominational. And I believe um, Marilyn, our, our national vice president did share that there were many different Hibernian societies that aren't associated or weren't associated with the ancient order of Hibernians. I didn't know if you would just agree with that description or if you had something additional to share. Well, to, to give you some perspective on the Hibernian society, uh, they, were, they were established, I believe in 1803 in Baltimore. So obviously uh, AOH and LAOH was, were, were considerably later. But they, but they were typically well-to-do uh, Irishmen, both Catholic and Protestant, that would, were committed to the education of, uh, of Irish who would arrive, whether Catholic or Protestant. Baltimore had a, a Hibernian free school for many years. Um, and what matter of fact, one of my ancestors went to it. But they, would all, they always had chaplains, but they would alternate between Protestant one, one year and Catholic the next trying to keep a nice balance between the, uh, between, between the uh, emphases of the organization. But they were, they were not a religious organization, but they were philanthropic and focused in on education primarily. But during the, of course, during the times of the arrivals, during the great hunger, they were concerned about keeping body and soul together, just like everybody else. And uh, so we're very thankful to Baltimore area for that organization that still exists today, uh, the Hibernian Society. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question had to do with um, the Catholic schools. Do you know, um, in addition to the immigrant Irish children, were African-American children allowed to attend? They were not allowed to attend. Uh, of course, Baltimore being a segregated city, they were not allowed to attend Catholic schools, uh, generally speaking. However, Baltimore had the first parish dedicated to first Catholic 
Catholic parish dedicated to African Americans in America. It was known as St. Francis Xavier uh, in East Baltimore, and other ones also opened up in later years. So one was called St. Peter Claver, another one, and there was a third one, which uh, I can't think of offhand, but uh, they had school dedicated to, to the, um, the education of, of Black Catholic children. Also in Baltimore, uh, there is a, a order of nuns called the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Uh, they, mo uh, Mother Mary Lang was the, was the main leader of that. She's up for, uh, I'm not sure where she is in the process of becoming a saint, but the, the things are progressing in that direction. Uh, they, they just built a new school uh, dedicated to her in West Baltimore, which I understand is glorious. I haven't been in, but I, I met some parents recently and they were just so complimentary. Uh, but anyway, this, the Oblate Sisters of Providence were a black order of nuns who focused uh, very much on the education of black children. That being said, they, it was the schools were separate for blacks and whites. All right, Luke, thank you so much. So I think that concludes the questions. There were several comments, um, folks, thanking you for your time. Um, really loved the, the history um, and learning more about the Irish in Baltimore. Uh, we even had a member or a participant, I should say, who um, has been to the Railroad Museum and gave it an endorsement thinking that it was a great place to visit. So, um, so I don't know if anybody has any last minute questions to add into the chat that I would share, but I'm, I'm not seeing any more. So that concludes, I believe that portion of um, the session. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. The work you and the Irish Railroad Workers Museum have done unearthing the past history of the Irish community has made it possible for people like myself to have a better understanding of the lives our ancestors lived. I would like to encourage everyone to visit the Irish Railroad Workers Museum Big Pivot blog at irishshrine.org and take advantage of the 75 historical stories the Irish have had on making America. Again, thank you again from the LAOH Luke for presenting today. My pleasure and enjoy the rest of your day. You're welcome. Thank you. That ends our session.